Chapters 11 through 20 of Against Celsus, Book 3 by Origen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. He says, in addition, that, quote, all the Christians were of one mind, end quote, not observing, even in this particular, that from the beginning there were differences of opinion among believers regarding the meaning of the books held to be divine. At all events, while the apostles were still preaching, and while eyewitnesses of the works of Jesus were still teaching his doctrine, there was no small discussion among the converts from Judaism regarding Gentile believers on the point whether they ought to observe Jewish customs or should reject the burden of clean and unclean meats as not being obligatory on those who had abandoned their ancestral Gentile customs and had become believers in Jesus. Nay, even in the epistles of Paul, who was contemporary with those who had seen Jesus, certain particulars are found mentioned as having been the subject of dispute, viz. respecting the resurrection, and whether it were already past, and the day of the Lord, whether it were nigh at hand or not. Nay, the very exhortation to, quote, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith, End quote, is enough to show that from the very beginning, when, as Celsus imagines, believers were few in number, there were certain doctrines interpreted in different ways. In the next place, since he reproaches us with the existence of heresies in Christianity as being a ground of accusation against it, saying that, quote, when Christians had greatly increased in numbers, they were divided and split up into factions each individual desiring to have his own party, end quote. And further, that, quote, being thus separated through their numbers, they confute one another, still having, so to speak, one name in common, if indeed they still retain it. And this is the only thing which they are yet ashamed to abandon, while other matters are determined in different ways by various sects, end quote. In reply to which, we say that heresies of different kinds have never originated from any matter in which the principle involved was not important and beneficial to human life. For since the science of medicine is useful and necessary to the human race, and many are the points of dispute in it respecting the manner of curing bodies, there are found, for this reason, numerous heresies confessedly prevailing in the science of medicine among the Greeks, and also, I suppose, among those barbarous nations who profess to employ medicine. And again, since philosophy makes a profession of the truth and promises a knowledge of existing things with a view to the regulation of life and endeavors to teach what is advantageous to our race, and since the investigation of these matters is attended with great differences of opinion, innumerable heresies have consequently sprung up in philosophy, some of which are more celebrated than others. Even Judaism itself afforded a pretext for the origination of heresies in the different acceptation according to the writings of Moses and those of the prophets. So, then, seeing Christianity appeared an object of veneration to men, not to the more servile class alone, as Celsus supposes, but to many among the Greeks who were devoted to literary pursuits, there necessarily originated heresies, not at all, however, as a result of faction and strife, but through the earnest desire of many literary men to become acquainted with the doctrines of Christianity. The consequence of which was that, taking in different acceptations, those discourses which were believed by all to be divine, there arose heresies, which received their names from those individuals who admired, indeed, the origin of Christianity, but who were led, in some way or another, by certain plausible reasons to discordant views. And yet no one would act rationally in avoiding medicine because of its heresies, nor would he who aimed at that which is seemly entertain a hatred of philosophy and adduce its many heresies as a pretext for his antipathy. And so, neither are the sacred books of Moses and the prophets to be condemned on account of the heresies in Judaism. 
Now, if these arguments hold good, why should we not defend in the same way the existence of heresies in Christianity? And respecting these, Paul appears to me to speak in a very striking manner when he says, quote, For there must be heresies among you, that they who are approved may be made manifest among you. End quote. For as many that man is approved in medicine who, on account of his experience in various medical heresies and his honest examination of the majority of them, has selected the preferable system, and as the great proficient in philosophy is he who, after acquainting himself experimentally with the various views, has given in his adhesion to the best, so I would say that the wisest Christian was he who had carefully studied the heresies both of Judaism and Christianity. Whereas, he who finds fault with Christianity because of its heresies would find fault also with the teaching of Socrates, from whose school have issued many others of discordant views. Nay, the opinions of Plato might be chargeable with error on account of Aristotle's having separated from his school and founded a new one, on which subject we have remarked in the preceding book. But it appears to me that Celsus has become acquainted with certain heresies which do not possess even the name of Jesus in common with us. Perhaps he had learned of the sects called Ophites and Cainites, or some others of a similar nature, which had departed in all points from the teaching of Jesus. And yet, surely, this furnishes no ground for a charge against the Christian doctrine. After this, he continues, quote, Their union is the more wonderful, the more it can be shown to be based on no substantial reason, and yet rebellion is a substantial reason, as well as the advantages which accrue from it, and the fear of external enemies, such are the causes which give stability to their faith. End quote. To this we answer that our union does thus rest upon a reason, or rather, not upon a reason, but upon the divine working, so that its commencement was God's teaching men in the prophetical writings to expect the advent of Christ, who was to be the Savior of mankind. For in so far as this point is not really refuted, although it may seem to be by unbelievers, in the same proportion is the doctrine commended as the doctrine of God and Jesus shown to be the Son of God both before and after his incarnation. I maintain, moreover, that even after his incarnation, he is always found by those who possess the acutest spiritual vision to be most godlike and to have really come down to us from God and to have derived his origin or subsequent development not from human wisdom, but from the manifestation of God within him, who by his manifold wisdom and miracles established Judaism first and Christianity afterwards, and the assertion that rebellion and the advantages attending it were the originating causes of a doctrine which has converted and improved so many men was effectually refuted. But again, that it is not the fear of external enemies which strengthens our union is plain from the fact that this cause, by God's will, has already, for a considerable time, ceased to exist, and it is probable that the secure existence, so far as regards the world, enjoyed by believers at present, will come to an end, since those who calumniate Christianity in every way are again attributing the present frequency of rebellion to the multitude of believers and to their not being persecuted by the authorities as in old times. For we have learned from the gospel neither to relax our efforts in days of peace and to give ourselves up to repose, nor, when the world makes war upon us, to become cowards and apostatize from the love of the God of all things which is in Jesus Christ. And we clearly manifest the illustrious nature of our origin and do not, as Celsus imagines, conceal it, 
when we impress upon the minds of our first converts a contempt for idols and images of all kinds, and besides this, raise their thoughts from the worship of created things instead of God, and elevate them to the universal creator, clearly showing him to be the subject of prophecy, both from the predictions regarding him, of which there are many, and from those traditions which have been carefully investigated by such as are able intelligently to understand the Gospels and the declarations of the Apostles. Quote, but what the legends are of every kind which we gather together, or the terrors which we invent, end quote. As Celsus, without proof asserts, he who likes may show. I know not, indeed, what he means by, quote, inventing terrors, end quote unless it be our doctrine of God as judge and of the condemnation of men for their deeds with the various proofs derived partly from scripture, partly from probable reason. And yet, for truth is precious, Celsus says at the close, quote, forbid that either I or these or any other individual should ever reject the doctrine respecting the future punishment of the wicked and the reward of the good, end quote. What terrors, then, if you accept the doctrine of punishment, do we invent and impose upon mankind? And if he should reply that, quote, we weave together erroneous opinions drawn from ancient sources and trumpet them aloud and sound them before men as the priests of Cybele clash their cymbals in the ears of those who are being initiated in their mysteries, end quote. We shall ask him in reply, quote, erroneous opinions from what ancient sources, end quote. For, whether he refers to Grecian accounts which taught the existence of courts of justice under the earth, or Jewish, which, among other things, predicted the life that follows the present one, he will be unable to show that we who, striving to believe on grounds of reason, regulate our lives in conformity with such doctrines, have failed correctly to ascertain the truth. He wishes, indeed, to compare the articles of our faith to those of the Egyptians, quote, among whom, as you approach, their sacred edifices are to be seen splendid enclosures and groves and large and beautiful gateways and wonderful temples and magnificent tents around them and ceremonies of worship full of superstition and mystery. But when you have entered and passed within, the object of worship is seen to be a cat or an ape or a crocodile, or a goat, or a dog, end quote. Now, what is the resemblance between us and the splendors of Egyptian worship, which are seen by those who draw near their temples? And where is the resemblance to those irrational animals which are worshipped within, after you pass through the splendid gateways? Are our prophets, and the God of all things, and the injunctions against images, objects of reverence in the view of Celsus also? and Jesus Christ crucified, the analog to the worship of the irrational animal? But if he should assert this, and I do not think that he will maintain anything else, we shall reply that we have spoken in the preceding pages at greater length in defense of those charges affecting Jesus, showing that what appeared to have happened to him in the capacity of his human nature was fraught with benefit to all men and with salvation to the whole world. In the next place, referring to the statements of the Egyptians who talk loftily about irrational animals and who assert that they are a sort of symbols of God or anything else which their prophets so termed are accustomed to call them, Celsus says that, quote, an impression is produced in the minds of those who have learned these things that they have not been initiated in vain, end quote. While with regard to the truths which are taught in our writings to those who have made progress in the study of Christianity through that which is called by Paul the gift consisting in the word of wisdom through the spirit and in the word of knowledge according to the spirit, Celsus does not seem even to have formed an idea, judging not only from what he has already said, but from what he subsequently adds in his attack upon the Christian system when he asserts that Christians, quote, repel every wise man from the doctrine of their faith and invite only the ignorant and the vulgar, end quote. On which assertions we shall remark in due time when we come to the proper place. 
he says, indeed, that, quote, We ridicule the Egyptians, although they present many by no means contemptible mysteries for our consideration when they teach us that such rites are acts of worship offered to eternal ideas, and not, as a multitude think, to ephemeral animals, and that we are silly because we introduce nothing nobler than the goats and dogs of the Egyptian worship in our narratives about Jesus." End quote. Now to this we reply, quote, Good sir, suppose that you are right in eulogizing the fact that the Egyptians present to view many by no means contemptible mysteries and obscure explanations about the animals worshipped among them, you nevertheless do not act consistently in accusing us as if you believed that we had nothing to state which was worthy of consideration, but that all our doctrines were contemptible and of no account, seeing we unfold the narratives concerning Jesus according to the wisdom of the world to those who are perfect in Christianity, regarding whom, as being competent to understand the wisdom that is in Christianity, Paul says, Quote, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, who come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. End quote. And we say to those who hold similar opinions to those of Celsus, quote, Paul then, we are to suppose, had before his mind the idea of no preeminent wisdom when he professed to speak wisdom among them that are perfect." End quote. Now, as he spoke with his customary boldness when in making such a profession, he said that he was possessed of no wisdom, we shall say in reply, first of all, examine the epistles of him who utters these words, and look carefully at the meaning of each expression in them, say, in those to the Ephesians, and Colossians, and Thessalonians, and Philippians, and Romans, and show two things, both that you understand Paul's words, and that you can demonstrate any of them to be silly or foolish. For if any one give himself to their attentive perusal, I am well assured either that he will be amazed at the understanding of the man who can clothe great ideas in common language, or, if he be not amazed, he will only exhibit himself in a ridiculous light, whether he simply state the meaning of the writer as if he had comprehended it, or try to controvert and confute what he only imagined that he understood. End of chapters 11 through 20 of Against Celsus, Book 3 by Origen. Read by David Ronald.